and thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar where we'll be talking about computer science standards in the K-8 classroom. We are um, excited to have our um, computer science specialist from the Department of Education with me hosting this webinar in a few moments and then three great presenters from Indiana schools who are going to be um, talking about what they are doing in their schools and their classrooms. But first, I want to cover a few housekeeping items um, as we get started. So hopefully, you have taken a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box. If you have not, um, please do so. Just tell the others who you are and where you're connecting from. Be sure when you use that chat window that you have selected everyone from that two drop down, it defaults to just me, and we want everybody to be able to see what um, everyone has to say in the chat. And use that chat not only to introduce yourself now, but use it throughout the call to either ask questions of our presenters or share your own ideas um, or things that you're doing in your classroom. Um, we want everybody to be a resource in this call, not just our presenters. So um, definitely share your questions and your thoughts uh, with the others. I have muted everybody as you have entered the call. Please keep your line muted so that we don't have background noise. Um, if I see people um, that are unmuted or hear noise, I will go through and mute people. Um, just so that we don't have those issues. Um, we do, like I said, encourage you to use that chat box for your questions. We won't have, we won't, um, have time to unmute and ask questions through the audio. I am recording this webinar, so I will post that next week on our YouTube channel, which is linked from our eLearning Lab webpage. So you can get to, you'll be able to get to this webinar and all of our previous webinars going back several years um, there on that YouTube channel. And um, we, we, we continue to add to that list, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, and this is part of our professional develop, the professional development opportunities that we have. We typically offer one to two webinars per month. Um, next month, we have two scheduled, Be Internet Awesome in Indiana, where we've got um, three technology coaches from around the state who will be talking about some uh, resources that they've put together and created um, around digital citizenship. And this is a great follow-up to our Digital Citizenship Week that Indiana celebrated last week. So we're just continuing on with that. Um, awareness and education of digital citizenship. And then at the end of the month, we're going to do a webinar about open resources um, with our own Molly Yoel, who will be um, hosting that. And we'll have some teachers, again, talking about what they're doing with open resources in their classrooms. Um, another opportunity for, oh, and we do um, award PGPs for our webinars. So I will be sending that out to all of you tomorrow. Um, and you know we we do a, it'll be a point for every webinar that you participate in. So we award those for each of our webinars. We also do um, we we are connected in Twitter, and we encourage you all to connect that way using the I and E Learn hashtag to connect to others not only in Indiana but others around the country and even outside of um, our country. We have people that connect with us and. We have Twitter chats every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. This week's is our um, digital leadership series, which is, what is this, the third one, Thursday of the month, um, is our digital leadership series. And this week it's on digital citizenship. Again, continuing that talk um, after our uh, digital citizenship week last week. And then another our professional development opportunity that we have is our book club. We do three book clubs a year, and we just started with our fall book club yesterday. Um, we are reading uh, Instant Relevance by Dennis Sheeran, and we just started those conversations. It's not too late to join in. Um, check out that website that is shown on your screen right now. Unfortunately, you can't click on the link, um, but if you go to that website or just go to our 
uh, e-learning website and go to our professional development opportunities, there is a link there. But that is seven weeks long. You can learn or earn up to 14 PGPs, and it's just a great way to connect to others. And that you do that on your own time whenever it's convenient for you. It's in a blog, so if mornings work for you, if weekends, if nights work better, whatever um, works with your schedule is when we encourage you to uh, join in the book club. So with that, I want to move on to our topic for the day. And um, we, like I said, we've got three great um, educators from around the state who are going to be talking about what they're doing in their classroom. And they will um, introduce themselves in a moment, or Jake will introduce them. But I'm first going to turn it over to um, Jake from the Department of Education, and he's going to get us started. And I don't hear you yet, Jake. How about if I try to unmute you? I'm going to unmute you and see if that works. Okay, try now, Jake. Can you hear me, can you hear me I now? Can hear you. I can hear you now. Yep, go ahead. Good, awesome. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Again, my name is Jake Caruso, and I'm the computer science specialist at the Indiana Department of Education. And I formerly, formerly taught um, math and computer science before I came on with the department in early June this year. So um, if you uh, want to go ahead and move on to the first, uh, the next slide, Mary, thank you. So I just want to start with kind of an overview of computer science standards K-8 and some assessment items that kind of go along with that. And uh, just talk about some things that you might consider when planning for computer science instruction and implementation in your school or district. And then I'll turn it over to uh, some practitioners that can give you some of their experiences and offer you some suggestions and best practices and things like that. So that's kind of the plan for this evening. Next slide. So just a little bit of an overview on the standards. Next slide, Mary. Um, computer science standards are housed within science in K-8. So science is divided into five different strands, one of which is computer science. And next slide. And then computer science is then divided into five separate strands, those being computing devices and systems, networking and communication, data and information, programs and algorithms, and impact and culture. So that's a little bit of kind of an overview on kind of where this, the standards fit in the grand scheme of things. Next slide. So a few, I, you know, a few things about what the standards are not. The standards are not curriculum, nor are they instructional practices, and they may not address students who are far below or far above grade level. So at the local level, it's completely your decision on what curriculum you go with um, and how you teach the standards, and then any interventions or extension activities that you might need to provide your students based on the level they're at and who they are, those are up to you as long as you're covering those standards and making sure that your students are gaining the skills and dispositions um, that are referenced in the standards. Next slide. So who's responsible for the computer science standards? The, the answer really is everyone. So even though computer science is kind of under the science umbrella, especially in, as the world continues to move towards a, uh, into a direction where computer science and technology is really interwoven throughout everything, we feel like that should really be reflected in, in the classroom as well. So um, it's really uh, not just the science teacher's responsibility to cover these standards. Um, to that point, it might be beneficial to identify someone who kind of oversees that or, or takes the lead on computer science implementation or developing a plan in your building. That could be some type of instructional coach, a technology teacher, any classroom teacher who just has an interest in computer science and technology. It's really a matter of whoever works the best for your school or district. But having that point person to help make, th make sure things are aligned and then all the standards are being covered and things like that can be really helpful. Next slide. So some considerations when you're planning. Um, A8 computer science standards have been 
in place in Indiana since 2016. Um, and implementation strategies can vary from school to school, but all those standards should be covered in all the grade levels from K to 8. Um, recently, in uh, that should be May of 2018, I apologize, um, Governor Holcomb publicly signed Senate Enrolled Act 172, which says that after June 30th of 2021, each public school, including each charter school, shall include computer science in the school's curriculum for students in kindergarten through grade 12. So compliance uh, looks a little bit different at the high school end of things than it does in K to 8, but it's, legis it's legislated and just kind of reiterates the importance of covering those K-8 computer science standards that have been in place since 2016. A misconception that um, is out there is that you have to be one-to-one -one devices to be able to teach computer science concepts. And while certainly certain strands of the standards might lend themselves to being taught um, with technology, and more and more schools are moving towards being in a one-to-one -one environment, that doesn't mean that that's a requirement or that it's a necessity. Um, there are ways to teach computer science standards, certainly in a one-to-one -one environment, but also with shared devices and in an unplugged way as well. So there's some flexibility there depending on the resources you have in your room um, or that your students have. Next slide. A few more considerations. The CS standards are divided into grade bands. So rather than each grade having their own set of standards, there's there are grade band standards for K to 2, 3 to 5, and 6 to 8. And those standards should be experienced during those grade bands. Um, so again, CS standards can be covered across multiple subject areas with, within those grade bands. The instruction for CS doesn't have to be limited to just science time, even though it falls under that science umbrella. Um, these standards should um, you should approach and instruct standards based on what is developmentally appropriate and age appropriate. And then it's highly encouraged that you collaborate with teachers, identify those point people, those key people in the implementation, and really start thinking about a plan so that you can make sure that students are prepared to move from one grade level to the next, one grade, in one grade band to the next, and really prepare them for with the skills that they need to have to be successful in high school and beyond as related to computer science and technology. Next slide, thank you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about some resources we have on the DOE website. There is a specific page dedicated to computer science, and that link that's on the, the slide there should get you there. The information on that website is updated very frequently, and we're growing our number of resources that we have on a weekly basis. Some things that you'll find if you go there, of course, are information related to the standards, but also more detailed information about Senate Enrolled Act 172, different things like our professional development opportunities. We're working really hard to identify a wide variety of professional development opportunities specifically related to computer science for teachers at various grade levels. So those would be listed there. That list is continuously updated as additional opportunities become available. So I'd recommend checking that. And if there's a certain type of professional development you're looking for and you don't see it there, I'd encourage you to reach out to me and I can see how we might be able to help um, help you get the, the resources that you need. And in addition, there's information about a recent partnership we have with Girls Who Code. So if you're looking for extracurricular opportunities for particularly girls in technology. We have that resource and as well as a variety of resources from the DOE and externally as well. And now I just want to touch on some assessment items. Next slide, please. Um, computer science standards will be assessed on the new iLearn assessment starting this coming spring, so in the 2018-19 school year. CS will be included as part of the iLearn grade four and grade six science assessments. And for the grade four assessment, that will cover standards in grade band three to five. And for the grade six assessment, that'll cover standards, computer science standards from grade band six to eight. And there are various resources, some of which I'm gonna go through in the next few slides, specifically related to assessment as well on the DOE website. 
First, I want to speak to the blueprints a little bit. The blueprints can be a great place to start when sort of planning um, for that assessment, just to see what types of content, what types of questions you might expect to see on the assessment related to computer science. This is half of the blueprint for the grade four exam on this slide. You can see I've highlighted the standards that are computer science standards. So you can kind of get a feel for where the computer science standards fit in into the various reporting categories. And you can also see how many questions you might expect to see on a particular assessment related to that particular standard. So this is a great resource to start with to see maybe which standards might be emphasized more than others and things like that. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see the other half of the blueprint for grade four. Again, the same types of information. I have the computer science standards highlighted and you can see how they fit into to these other two reporting categories. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you also the grade six blueprint. So it looks very similar things. Um, the reporting categories are the same. I've highlighted the computer science standards here as well. Same type of information is available. And you can see, you can download these and find some other assessment resources if you go to the link that is on the screen right now. So that's where you can go to download those as PDFs and, and take a closer look if you'd like. And then this is just the other half of the grade six blueprint, so you can see that as well. Another resource related to iLearn um, that is available that is really useful, I think, are the item specifications. There are items that, item specifications that have been developed for each standard, and each specification has a variety of information that can be helpful from the standard itself to the depth of knowledge to a sample question and its corresponding answer, as well as a variety of other types of information. I'm going to give you a, a glance at a couple of those now. If we can go to the next slide. This is in a specification for standard 3-5.cd.1. So you can see at the very top it says what the standard is. If you look down a little bit, you'll see a sample item. It gives you the solution to that sample item as well and a variety of other information. The, the link to this particular item specification database is kind of long, so I've shortened it and given it to you up in the top left corner of the screen there. So if you want to take a closer look and dive into these item specifications, you can. Again, there's one for each standard uh, that's being assessed on the exam that you choose to look at. So if we go forward, on this slide, there is just another item spec for a 6 to 8 grade band standard. So this is for 6 to 8.cd.2. Same format, same types of information just for this, this particular standard. And that's kind of my general overview on the standards themselves and some assessment information. This is my contact information. If there's any way that I can be a support to you or any information I can help you with or if there are any, any anything else I can do to help in your computer science implementation, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to help. Also follow me at Indiana underscore CS. I try to tweet useful information as well so you can connect with me on Twitter as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to some of our awesome guest presenters uh, that Mary spoke of earlier. First, we're going to hear from Maria Sellers from South Vermilion Middle School. Awesome. Am I able to be heard? Yes. Excellent. So my name is Maria Sellers. I'm from South Vermilion. It's uh, pretty much the first stoplight on the way to Chicago from Terre Haute, Indiana. So we're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I've been an e-learning e coach, uh, music teacher, and now I'm in the position of um, a game teacher. So next slide, please. Uh, so in game class, we teach digital citizenship, digital literacy. Um, I'm also covering business standards, college and career life skills, and then any kind of IT that I can get in. So it's quite a bit. Um, next slide, please. So essentially, I have 12 weeks 
uh, to cover all of this stuff. And we're still mapping things out, but I really try to make computer science a huge part of the entire 12 weeks and embed it within. So what I've done, and I don't have a slide of this, um, each day is themed. And so every Wednesday and Thursday, I make sure that I cover computer science um, in some way, whether it be a structured lesson or a lesson where kids are exploring. Uh, next slide, please. And so here is where we are. In the past, I've used uh, several resources, and I was kind of all over the place. Uh, but I just this past summer decided to just focus on one resource and went with code.org uh, to their pathways this summer uh, through Next Tech and have been able to get a little bit better vision in terms of what should I be doing for each grade level to ensure that I'm giving, giving them something really solid um, that may encourage them to study computer science in high school. So as you can see, I split the computer science discoveries in code.org throughout the grade. So I'm doing one and two, which really does start with a lot of unplugged, and I'll talk about that further. Um, and then seventh grade does units three and four, and then eighth grade, I try to get through five and six. And so that's kind of how I've done my progressive build. Next slide, please. And so for sixth grade, they're getting a lot of unplugged. The, the entire first unit of um, the CS discoveries is unplugged. So we're doing a lot of computer science and at first the kids are very frustrated, uh, but I do explain that we need this foundation. We need this launch pad to be able to go further. And it seems to have worked really, really well. Uh, we, there's the aluminum boats in there. When we were playing with water on the first day, uh, going through a problem solving activity, the kids were really excited. And once I could explain, we need all of this to go forward, uh, it, it worked out really well. So I highly suggest that if you're looking for something and just not quite sure where to go with it. Um, so we'll do units one and two, and then end with a project using the spheros. Um, next slide, please. And so I wanted to build in some writing skills, uh, some STEM, and of course the coding that we learn um, throughout the course. So they have to build a bridge that will hold their sphero, but also allow the sphero to cross over, um, whether it be two chairs or two tables. And so they'll, they'll get a card in an envelope that tells them what they're allowed to use, what height uh, do they have to drive across, and so forth. And so this is super duper interesting to see how kids actually went about it. Um, but it, it was really, really excellent. So uh, at the very end of this, I do have a slide that contains all of these challenges. But um, I, I highly recommend it. They get to do the coding that they've learned with the Sphero, which I can't say enough about the Spheros. The kids absolutely love them. Um, I think they're super excited to get to that point. Uh, next slide, please. And then seventh grade, of course, like I said, we get into units three and four of the CS Discoveries, which again is both unplugged and plugged. Um, it's more coding, which is really good, but there are still unplugged lessons, which is highly critical. Um, and we go through this whole thing um, with them knowing that there's going to be a big project at the end, and if they don't know the coding that we learn, their project will not be as successful as I think they want it to be. Um, so next slide, please. And so in this challenge, they have to write a story that can then be animated through their Sphero. So they have to create a setting. They have to uh, do the actual coding. Once they start at the beginning, they cannot touch the Sphero. So essentially, they have to make sure it, it's, it's basically an obstacle course. Once they hit start, that Sphero had best go on the right path from beginning to end. Um, so it takes a lot of planning, a lot of research, and some serious accuracy on their part in terms of coding. Um, next slide, please. And then eighth grade, I try to take it up a notch. This is where they're doing a lot of coding. Uh, we do have a few unplugged lessons, but in five and six, they're doing some big in-depth work. And believe it or not, I've not even been trained uh, myself on five and six. That's in the near future. So um, I look forward to a lot of what we're doing. But I know, I am told, that I will have to have a rather extensive word wall um, with tags and code language for the students. So 
I'm super excited to get there, um, a little bit nervous, uh, but I, I really do think so far with the training I've received through code.org, it's going to be awesome. So I wish I could tell you a lot more, but I'm a little bit unsure as to what I'm facing. Um, next slide, please. But I do know this. <laughs> we did this last year with my eighth grade, and they've, of course, already sh shared the secret out with the, the seventh graders from last year. Um, so they're super excited about this. So I actually built a miniature golf course in my class, and they cannot use drag and drop coding to code any of these um, spots in the course. So it, it was really interesting to see how, how they reacted in terms of they have to play this like a real golf game. So if you go 20 over par, you have to write that down on your card. Um, and it gave them a real life experience as well as coding. Um, and I can tell you some kids did really, really well. Some kids did struggle. But I think having a big challenge like this related to a real world setting was really big for them. Um, so they were super excited. And I will admit, I, I failed this. I was terrible. <laughs> Um, a lot of the kids were much, much better than me, uh, but that was exciting to see them just totally rock it, even though I couldn't. So uh, next slide, please. So how did I get here? Um, I went from being an e-learning specialist, and they called me in and said, well, we need a game teacher at the middle school, and you have to cover business standards, um, the computer science standards, and college and career prep, uh, which was overwhelming. <laughs> But I thought, or, you know, we can make this happen. So I instantly went to code.org because I knew a lot of the stuff in there was already there. I didn't have to be an expert learner because it, it was such an awesome guide for students. Um, so I do suggest going to there. I did use the Express course at first, which I found was a big mistake. Um, there wasn't enough unplugged to give the students a foundation. But when I did research the discoveries, I felt that that was something that my students could handle. Um, I did let my students just get out there and get on YouTube and find out what could code do for them. And once I had some stake for them, um, if, you know, their favorite video game is coded. Their favorite apps are coded. Once I got them into the realization that, you know what, you could be the one coding that and making the money, they were invested. Um, I found some local companies who coded, uh, had some people in the computer science department and brought them in. Um, some high school kids who are in my digital leadership class, um, they came over and talked to the kids and shared some possibilities with them. So you don't have to be the expert at all. There are other people who can come in and really encourage your, your kids. Um, so I would really jump at that. And then for me, finding something tangible that the kids could use, that's why I brought the Spiros in. We could be on code.org all day long, but they need that something uh, to show them that, yeah, you can control something. It's a lot of fun. Um, so I'm not trying to sell code.org, but it really did give me a good launching pad to be successful. And I don't know if that's my last slide, but it might be. Uh, there it is. So if any of the challenges that I just showed you, the activities, that is the link that will take you to a Google slide, um, which has more links on it for you. So you can grab a hold of those and take what you need. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, now we're going to hear from Ryan Bean. He teaches kin kindergarten through grade eight at Sense Charter School in downtown Indy. Um, so we're going to hear some of his experience with computer science. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, great. Hi, Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Bean. I teach, like Jacob just said, K through eight computer science at Sense Charter School in Fountain Square. Um, it's a big benefit getting them grades K through 8. Um, we started algorithms in kindergarten, just basic algorithms, yeses and nos, step-by-step -step, uh, sort of building plan algorithms. Uh, by the time they get to 8th grade, then at that point they are very advanced. They're ready for those code.org curriculums, and I'm able to do a lot of good computer science with them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so my approach to CS education is that it should be social and collaborative. I love having my students talk about their code, discuss their code. Almost every, part, every, almost every project we do is partner project. Code.org, which I utilize in middle school, has a lot of good uh, partner, or what they call it, pair coding. Uh, pair coding projects where two people code almost persistently through every project. Uh, when students talk about their code, they're inherently reflecting on that code and reflecting on their thinking. I find that to be very productive and good for them. 
Um, I use a lot of project-based learning, especially when I do um, lean towards robotics um, and authentic lessons. I like to root everything in real computer science applications. So me and my classes stay very up to date with current trends in technology and robotics and self-driving cars and all that really neat stuff that helps them keep it helps them keep engaged. And then I'm able to model a lot of my lessons based off of those sort of real life experiences. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of best practices, things that I found to be really successful within my own classroom. Um, this is very, I would say, applicable to unplugged activities or when you're working with robotics. I love using Flipgrid and Padlet as my digital blogging tools. Um, if you're not familiar with these, uh, Flipgrid is, I use that for video responses. So I can just post a simple question to this website, Flipgrid. Um, it's a free website, and students are able to log in on a Chromebook or I lend them my laptop sometimes and say, go in the hallway and make your video blog. And I'll have the pair reflect or answer questions that I've posted there. This works really well for me as an alternative to writing an essay or writing a paper and gives me a chance to sort of grade them or assess them on their knowledge um, while sort of gaining a little bit of bonus classroom time because they're not talking directly to me then, they're talking to a computer. And then I use Padlet as an online forum where kids are free to post pictures, um, images, text, anything that they want to do. So I can take pictures of their robots, of algorithms, or any unplugged, any unplugged activity and post it there. Next slide, please. Um, so I just started using this, year, using this system this year. I found it to be very beneficial. I wish I had used this the last three years I was working or teaching computer science. Um, Veyon Computer Monitoring System is a free software. It allows the teacher to lock all computers on with one click, open websites for all the computers, and view all the screens simultaneously. Especially when, especially when you're working with little kids, kindergarten age students who, at least in my demographic, don't have any mouse skills, it's really beneficial to have a website open on the computers and ready for them. And from a teacher's perspective, using this software, I'm, open, I'm, avail, or I'm able to open a single website on all the computers instantly. So that, that's really helpful and very beneficial, and it helps keep uh, the student's attention very easily. Next slide, please. Uh, take advantage of grants. I, this is the best way to get computer science or robotics started at your school. Um, I, I use, I use, I've utilized all three of these um, grant programs uh, throughout the last year. TechPoint, Girl Power, Next Tech, they've funded two full robotics teams for VEX this year alone. Um, they've given me a whole lot of money to do some really incredible things over the past few years. If you're trying to start a robot, a robotics team, or any kind of computer science, I highly encourage you to check these out. Next slide, please. All right, I want to go over two of my favorite lessons. Um, this first one, binary unplugged. This is sort of my uh-oh lesson. The power is out. The computers are down. The internet's offline. This is what I jump into almost immediately. I've taught this as low as grade two, but it's applicable beyond grade eight two. Next slide, please. So I, I usually frame this as sort of like a math puzzle kind of lesson. I think that binary is incredibly integral to just a foundational understanding of computer science. Um, even just thinking about yeses and nos, off and ons, all the switches that take place. Um, this kind of jumps back into Boolean understanding too. Uh, but binary is just um, base two number systems. I always frame this as a puzzle though. So I would write this on a whiteboard or on the um, whiteboard up front, whatever. Um, and sort of let students figure this out on their own. Next slide, please. Um, so I would model one number after the other. I don't. I never explain them how to do it. I let kids sit and reflect on this individually. Um, so I, I would go one, then a larger number of three. As you can see, um, if you're familiar with binary, you can see that two plus one would equal three then. Um, next slide. As you start getting into the higher numbers, students are going to start figuring out how to do it. And I'd like to take student volunteers. Uh, students are often very proud and happy to answer the questions and to have solved the puzzle sort of individually on their own. Next slide, please. Um, I, fi I feel like this is really hard for teachers to approach without having tried it before. Um, this is a great lesson. I've had incredible success with it. Um, after the students um, sort of all get the hang of it, I like to have them do a little bit of in independent practice, too. Um, I have a student explain to the class how they're solving their problems and go from there. Next slide, please. Um, halfway through this lesson, I transitioned to BrainPop. There's a fantastic BrainPop on binary code. Um, 
I use that to reinforce their discussion and sort of re-engage them in a video instead of just watching people write numbers on a whiteboard. Next slide, please. Um, from there, um, we go back to the binary chart. We realize that we can't make a number as big as 35 without adding numbers to the left column. Um, in order to get to those bigger numbers, you have to expand the chart a little bit. I sort of let the students fail here and then come back and figure it out on their own. Next slide, please. Um, take some more volunteers, solve some more problems, make the numbers get bigger and bigger. Students get excited at this point. Um, by this point, most of the students should be raising their hand, asking questions, or volunteering to solve one of the problems. Next slide, please. Then we transition to independent practice. I usually have a half sheet of paper printed out with a graph that looks something like this. Um, I throw the students in pairs to solve each of the problems. Next slide, please. Um, for an expansion on this, I've had students solve an extremely large number. I've done 100,000. I've done numbers as big as 1 million. Um, students come back with enormous pieces of paper. It's taken them a long time to figure it out. Uh, but I usually entice them some kind of prize with that. Um, th there's also the binary alphabet that, uh, alphabet that exists, so students can write their names in binary alphabet. Um, you can think of the letter A as the number one, B as two, C as three. And the students you sort of use that math um, to write out their names or secret messages. Next slide, please. All right, uh, favorite lesson. Um, I use this with the Lego EV3 systems. This is called Artbotics. Um, I was able to go to a workshop through Next Tech that gave me a couple of these great systems and tools. Um, I'm working, this in my, working with this in my class right now. We've made some really incredible projects. Um, I've done this as low as grades three. Um, this does require to have some kind of robotic system, Arduino, VEX, LEGO EV3. And I have, I'm fortunate enough to have 3D printed marker holders, um, but I'm sure you could finagle some kind of homemade solution as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so students in this scenario um, use 3D printed marker holders to make drawings. I use this as a foundation to um, algorithms and booleans and loops. It's really um, easy to do it like this. So you can imagine the algorithm here where a robot would just move forward a little bit, take a turn, move forward, turn another direction, and then loop again. Once you put a robot on that marker, it's going to make a little pattern like this. I usually have my students make two or three or four um, different algorithm, algorithms within a loop to make some really incredible robot drawings. Um, I use this in almost all my robot classes to introduce just the basic concepts of algorithms and loops. Next slide, please. Um, going off of this, after we do the drawings, we move into kinetic artwork. In this case, the students first learn four mechanical movements, the crank, the cam, the high torque gear, and the high speed gear. Um, this gets really deep into STEM here, and you're able to include a lot of physics within this too. Um, students will build all four of these mechanical movements before deciding which one they want to use in a kinetic artworks project. Next slide, please. All right, so students can build a 3D, 2D or 3D kinetic artwork system. Um, in this case, the picture shown here, they have a scene. Um, they did this based off of the eclipse last year, where they used a crank to have the sun, or maybe it's the moon in this one, but the moon wave in front of the sun to simulate an eclipse. So students, so students are able to take a rotational movement, make a waving movement out of it using a crank, um, program it to be reactionary to its environment. I think in this case, they use the ultrasonic sensor. So whenever you came close to it, um, it started running the program, making noise and running the motor for the crank too. Next slide, please. Um, this one's utilizing a cam. So they took um, Gandalf here or um, Mag Magneto, I think it was here. And his mouth actually goes up and down using the cam. This one was a little bit creepier, but it was very fun. Um, at the end of this whole unit, I hold a Artbotics Expo. Mine's actually coming up this Friday. I'm very excited for it, where students are able to display their drawings and robots. We invite everyone from the school to come check it out. And in that case, I'm able to explain to everybody how the algorithms are made, how the drawings are made, how the students can program everything. And then the whole school gets to see these mechanical movements and the students' great creations. Everyone pre prepares their own speeches, and it always works out really great. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that was it for me. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. All right. Thank you, Ryan, very much. Next, we're going to hear from Katie Sparks from Monroe County Schools. Great. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So my name is Katie Sparks. I'm the STEM and Computer Science Coach for Monroe County Community Schools Corporation in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I just took that position this year. Before that, I've been teaching for eight years. Seven of those years were at Grandview Elementary, which is a STEM certified school here in Bloomington. And I also had the opportunity to be on the Indiana STEM Council. Next slide, please. So when I took on this new role, one of the first jobs that I was given was to create a doable computer science curriculum. And one of the things that they stressed was they really wanted teachers to feel like it was easy to implement or not just another thing, something that they could integrate into what they're already doing. And so we looked, um, there were some digital learning coaches that had already been working on this. And they had this huge spreadsheet that had all of the computer science standards linked to things that we were already doing in our math and science curriculums. And um, my job was really to make that manageable for teachers to look at and access. And so we broke it down into these three categories that we're going to be covering this year. And we assigned each of these categories to a quarter so that teachers could focus on one goal each quarter. So in the first quarter, we're focusing on digital citizenship. Um, the second quarter, we're going to be focusing on computational thinking and coding. And in the third quarter, we'll get into some engineering challenges with collaboration. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those three quarterly goals and how we're presenting that to teachers and providing them with support throughout the year. Next slide, please. For digital citizenship, our district uses common sense media. We decided to start the year with this piece since it goes nicely with uh, rolling out devices. We are a one-to-one -one district and so we feel like it's important to teach our, our students how to use those devices uh, safely and appropriately and also just to teach them how to be effective in what they're searching and the research that they're doing. So quarter one, digital citizenship focus for the teachers and the students. Next slide, please. Quarter two is when we get into our computational thinking and we also use code.org a lot. Um, we found that code.org is pretty easy for teachers to manage and the students really get into it. And like Maria mentioned, we love the unplugged lessons paired with the plugged lessons. And we've really been stressing to teachers the importance of teaching those unplugged lessons. Um, we've also taught in your math or reading block if you can find those ways to tie it in. So next slide, please. That's what I've been doing a lot of, is I've been going into classrooms and kind of modeling some of these lessons in the reading block. Um, I've focused primarily on K, actually pre-K to five, but K to five at, to this point. And I've been using Picture Perfect STEM, which if you're not familiar with that curriculum, it's a big, thick manual, but then it comes with a lot of um, picture books if you order it that way, or you can just get the manual and find the picture books on your own. So, um, this lesson I did in a second grade room, but all of the Picture Perfect STEM lessons pair a fiction picture book with a nonfiction picture book. And in this particular lesson, the students had to program their robotic friend to follow an algorithm. So on the next slide, there are some pictures of the students. So I read them a book, um, a fiction book about robots, and I asked them, you know, what do you think these ro robots were programmed to do? And we talked about how ro robots will only do what they're programmed to do. And so we are going to write a code or a program for, for our friends to sort some pasta. So we had pasta, spiral pasta, and bow tie pasta, and the students had to sort that. You can see the one student has her eyes covered because she's the robotic arm. She can't see what her hand's doing. And the other student is reading his algorithm um, that he has written. And from there, we talked about, would you like this job? Do you think a robot could do this job more efficiently? And then we watched a video of a robotic arm um, sorting some chocolates. Next slide, please. And this one was in a first grade classroom. Same idea, um, a fiction picture book paired with a nonfiction picture book. The fiction book was The Day the Crayons Came Home. We talked about physical changes to the crayons. Then we did some crayon observations. Um, and then we actually melted the crayons there with a hair dryer. But after that, the students had a chance. They had these little cards that had the steps of making a crayon. They put them in the order that they thought the crayons were, were made. And then we um, read a nonfiction book and they watched a video. And then we put our algorithm in the correct order. And we talked a lot about how the steps have to be in the right order. 
um, in order for it to work. And if a computer is reading that program, the, um, the events have to go in order. I see a question for me, if, if that's about how long these lessons are. Um, typically, the Picture Perfect STEM lessons can be done as a unit, like over the course of a week. What I've been doing is doing them over the course of two days, where I come in and teach the first lesson in about 45 minutes. And then the classroom teacher follows up the next day with the second half of the lesson. But there are enough activities within the Picture Perfect curriculum that you could stretch it out further. And a lot of times, we don't do them exactly as they're written. We just kind of adapt for what we're needing. So these are two lessons. Like I said, they're from Picture Perfect STEM, but we've kind of adapted them to fit some of the computer science standards. Next slide, please. So in the third quarter, our goal for teachers and students is going to be to focus on the engineering challenges. We're going to tie those to literacy as well, either picture books or novels, depending on the grade level. Again, using the Picture Perfect STEM curriculum. A lot of teachers in our district also like the Storybook STEM curriculum, which is from Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, but we're showing teachers that they can teach these standards in their reading block tied to a picture book or a novel that have a strong problem that the students can solve by engineering or creating something to solve that problem. Um, we're also going to be focusing in this quarter on using some collaborative technology so the students will be working in small groups. Then they might be sharing their work with each other via Google Slides or another uh, app that the teachers choose. Next slide, please. So here's an example of me in a kindergarten classroom teaching uh, an engineering lesson. This one, um, we read the picture book Newton and Me. And before I read it, I demonstrated, or I asked the students to demonstrate um, how a car, if a little toy car was moving, it could, how could we slow it down? Well, we could change the surface that it's rolling on. How could we stop it? We could put something in front of it. And then as, I'm, as I read the book, I asked students to look for things that they felt related to the demonstrations we had just done. And after reading, you can see the group there on the right, they, the challenge was to create a, uh, the ramp, so they're holding up that board as the ramp, and then they had to drop the dog, the dog is in the car, so drop the car down the ramp to park him in his doghouse, which is the cup there at the bottom with the, a little hole cut in it. So they're adjusting, um, they could add felt, they could add the little blue containers have different weights. So they're working together, collaborating to engineer a solution that will uh, get the car in the doghouse. Next slide, please. And this one is actually from when I taught third grade. Um, we read Rosie Revere Engineer, which has a great lesson about perseverance. She works really hard to build all sorts of things and they just never work. And, um, finally, she's able to build something that does fly a little bit, and the challenge here is to create a balloon-powered car. One of the things I really liked about this challenge was the way that the materials were organized. Um, there were certain things that students could use as a power source, certain materials they could use as axles, and certain materials they could use as wheels, and uh, they were sorted out prior to the students beginning their building. But we also really focused on the engineering design process. So with any challenge that we do where the students are actually building something, teaching them to first ask the questions, create a plan, um, and then actually build whatever it is that they've planned. And then there's a cycle of testing and improving that design. And this one took a lot of testing and improving, but they did get it. Um, and in the meantime, when they were starting to feel a little frustrated, we took a break and we read the book, The Inventor's Secret, What Thomas Edison Told Henry Ford. And basically the secret is that you have to just keep trying and you can't give up. And they talk about how Henry Ford went from a Model A, well, that didn't work, a Model B, that didn't work, a Model C, that didn't work, all the way until he got to a Model T car, and that's the one that finally worked. So um, it's really, it, there's, there's a good life lesson in there, too. But the students really focused on their creating and testing and improving in this particular challenge. Next slide, please. So in our district, I talked about the three main goals that we're focusing on this year, the digital citizenship, the coding, and the engineering and design. But we really are um, 
planning on our teachers implementing most of that, our classroom teachers, with the media specialists teaching some of the lessons and a lot of support from the STEM, computer science, and digital learning coaches in our district. So we see our role as modeling some of those lessons, co-teaching, and providing professional development. But we feel it's really powerful when this curriculum is integrated and comes from the classroom teachers. And then next slide, please. I've just included my email address here and my Twitter handle. If you have any other questions, I would be happy to help. Thank you very much, Katie. So thank you to, again to all three of our guest presenters who shared some of their experiences with computer science with all of us. Um, I'm happy to hang out in the chat for a little bit and answer questions that anyone might have or if anyone else wants to share ideas or anything like that, that sounds great. Otherwise, um, I'll turn it back over to Mary in case she has any um, closing comments. Well, thank you. This was awesome. This was a lot of um, really great um, information. And um, hopefully everybody has something to take back to their classroom or their school with them, um, another, you know, some new ways to teach the computer science standards. And I just have um, this last slide that I have is just um, ways to keep in contact with us. Um, we try to be wherever you all are. So these are the places where you can find us. And like I said, I have recorded, I've been recording this webinar and um, should have it available by the middle of next week on our YouTube channel, which you can get to from our professional development page. And I had a couple people ask about the slides, so I will get with our presenters and just confirm that they are fine with me sharing the slideshow. And I, if they are, I will send that link out to everybody who um, signed in to the webinar today whose email addresses I have. And I will also send out PGP emails tomorrow. And it does not look like we've had any more questions come in. So um, please feel free to reach out to um, me and those of us in the Office of eLearning, um, reach out to Jake with questions. Um, whoever you get at the DOE, whichever one of us, um, we will get you to the right place. Um, don't feel like you have to know exactly who to ask your question of um, because, you know, I get, a lot of, I get a lot of questions that I cannot answer, but there's a great um, body of knowledge at the Department of Education. So we will get you to the right person. Jake has shared his email address in the chat box. Um, I will put mine there also if you have any need to contact me. Um, but we will um, leave the chat open for another minute or two. But otherwise, um, we'll say good night and thank you all for joining us. And please join us in the future for another webinar or for a book, book club. Um, or in our Twitter chats. Thanks a lot. Have a great night.